What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be discussing the E92 M3. I've had this car for about six months now and I also owned an E90 M3 a few years back. So I feel like I have a good grasp as to what it actually takes to buy these cars, what to look out for, some of the common maintenance problems, and just overall what you should expect when buying an E9X M3. The great part about owning the E90 M3 and the E92 M3 is that one was a DCT and one was a manual. So I have a really good understanding as to how both of those cars feel and how they respond to modifications and what you can expect when it comes to maintenance on both of those chassis. But first things first, let's talk a little bit about my E92 M3 and give you sort of a spec breakdown. All right, you guys, so here is my 2008 E92 M3. It is actually a Jerez Black E92 M3. However, I did have it wrapped. The wrap color itself is KPMF Ice Titanium Silver. Over. Looks really, really good, especially with all of the choices of modifications I've decided to do. But just a basic breakdown of my particular spec. This is a pre-LCI, which is the 2008. It does have the sunroof, so I don't have the carbon roof, unfortunately. And also it is the manual transmission as well as the single hump. Some people prefer having the iDrive. Some people prefer having the single hump, no nav. I've had both, so my E90 M3 actually had the navigation and that was a DCT and that one was an LCI. After having both, I prefer the single hump. It's less clutter on the dash. I don't really use the CarPlay or anything like that in these older cars. Kind of think that these older cars are just better when they are driver focused and less screens, more of an analog feel to them. But yeah, overall, I just like the simplicity and cleanliness of the single hump. I think they look really good. I also think that the iDrives from this era just look super outdated. So that's kind of fun because when people first bought these cars, you know, it was better to have the screen because that was an upgrade. But now I think that these single humps have sort of made a comeback and they're kind of like the ideal spec. But again, this is all subjective. Something that I did figure out recently, which is kind of funny, is a place to put your phone. This is like the perfect spot to put your phone and it stays right there. Like the thing does not move at all. I had no idea. But as you can see, you know, the car does have the manual transmission, um, six speed. It's really, really nice. I love it. Very raw analog feel to the car, very driver focused you feel very connected to this car and part of the reason for that is going to be the hydraulic steering the steering in these cars feel really really good it's very heavy as soon as you go over to the f chassis you sort of lose all of that feeling everything becomes electronic and assisted which some people are going to prefer but i think when it comes down to these cars that you know they're not the fastest it's all about just the driving experience in general i prefer to have all of that feeling and all of that connection from the car to the driver and the hydraulic steering really plays a big role in that in my opinion. So like I said, my E90 M3 was in fact an LCI. It did have the nav screen. However, the E90 did not have a carbon roof either. So both of my cars had the sunroof, which, you know, I would like to actually put a carbon roof on this car in the future. I am gonna actually also be repainting this car in the future because the Jerez black paint just really isn't in that great of condition. But this is one of the earlier models. So some people were kind of afraid of buying these cars because it can always be a bit concerning when you're buying the first year first production year of any car that is released because they're still kind of ironing out some of the bugs. However, overall, this car has been really good to me. I haven't really come across anything too unexpected. So I've had this car for six months now and it's been pretty good ownership experience. Before we get into the modifications, let's talk a little bit about maintenance. Maintenance is a big factor when it comes to these cars, rod bearings, throttle actuators. We all know the obvious things that need to be addressed on these cars and they are not myths. You will have to do the throttle actuators. You will have to do the rod bearings. I think there are a couple of extra things that I want to discuss today that some people don't really talk about. And a lot of that is just what to expect when you have an older car. You know, this is a 2008. It is a pretty old car. Talking 15 years old, there are going to be things that just go bad because it's an older car and you should have to expect to replace them. So when it came to my car in particular, when I first bought this car, the brakes were in really bad condition. So I actually ended up replacing all of the brakes with E9, just factory E92 M3 brakes. Obviously, it's not what I have on here now, but we'll talk a little bit about that in the future. So that was something that, you know, it's a wear and tear item, like brakes go bad. You're gonna have to do them at some point. You can get lucky and maybe the previous owner does them before you, but in my case, uh, mine were really, really bad. So I had to do all the brakes all the way around. I even had two calipers in the rear that were completely seized. It was overall not too expensive. I was able to find some used ones for a couple of hundred bucks and that at least got me on the road. The other thing, 
second was the suspension. The suspension was completely shot in this car. This car was also previously tracked in its life. So there were just a lot of things that needed to be updated, needed to be refreshed because it had been driven and driven hard. But again, I kind of knew that that was what I was getting into. I didn't pay as much as most people are paying for these cars. I got this car for a really good deal at the time when I bought it. The car currently has 94,000 miles on it. I bought it with a little under 90,000 miles. So, you know, 2008, 90,000 miles, there's gonna be quite a few things that need to be replaced. And continuing that discussion, the other things that I wanna talk about are a lot of the suspension arms, the control arms, the sway bar end links, the sway bar bushings, thrust arms, upper control arms, inner and outer tie rods. A lot of these things were just completely shot on my car. And you could tell right away, even after I got an alignment, had a lot of shaking going on in the steering wheel. And so I pretty much knew it was going to be one of those situations where I was gonna overhaul everything. Whether you go with OEM or aftermarket, you're going to have to change out suspension components. It's gonna happen. That is also a wear and tear item. It's just bound to go bad depending on the age and mileage of the vehicle. The other interesting thing that I had go wrong in this car when I first bought it was the fuel sending unit, which is on the driver's side of the fuel tank in the back. A lot of times if you smell gas in these cars, on top of that fuel sending unit, you'll start to get a lot of stress fractures in the plastic, which will then start seeping gas out from the top. It reeks, you can smell it, you'll know right away. And if you just remove the back seats and look at the top of the fuel sending unit, shine a light on it, you'll be able to see that there are some stress cracks. I replaced mine and I haven't had any issues since. One of the other things that I took care of were obviously my rod bearings. So I did go with an oversized rod bearing replacement kit. I have all this stuff linked down below, but basically we went through the entire procedure. Even though some people say that they do them, if there's no proof of it, I'm gonna go ahead and just do it anyways. I would rather be safe than sorry. I do intend on keeping this car and driving it hard and I don't want to risk this motor. So we went ahead and knocked that out. It was one of the first things that we did. I have not done throttle actuators in this car yet. However, I am going to do them. That is just something that is inevitably going to go out. You know, I don't know if they've been done before. They probably have not, but um, at some point I'm gonna have to do them before, you know, I leave myself stranded. I guess another thing you could talk about are valve covers. A lot of times with these cars, you'll find leaky valve covers. It's super common with the E92 M3s. I'm gonna assume that mine were replaced before I bought this car because these valve covers actually look really, really good. Another pretty common issue that you hear about with these cars are the Venus caps cracking. They are made of plastic, so they can fail. I haven't had that issue in mine. I don't think it's as common of a problem, but it is something that is to be noted that some people have had issues with. The other thing that we also replaced in my car was the water pump and thermostat. The factory one is actually made of plastic and I ended up going with an upgraded one that is made of metal. It's just gonna be more durable, it's gonna last longer and hopefully won't have any issues down the road with that one. Lastly, I also replaced all of the pulleys and belts. So pretty common again in a car, you know, that has 90,000 miles, you're gonna have to replace the belts at some point and likely the pulleys. I actually have an entire maintenance sheet that I made with prices and links and everything. I have that link down below for you guys if you wanna check it out. But basically I bought the entire pulley and belt refresh kit. Now this car actually does have the Dynan underdrive pulley, but you can still get a replacement belt for that pulley kit because it is a little bit different than your factory OEM underdrive pulley. I almost forgot to mention the biggest flex. Both of them work. But other than that, those are really the only maintenance items that I've had to address. This car has actually been really, really good to me. It just took a little bit of elbow grease and some cash up front to, you know, get it to the point where it's at now. I would say though, at this point, I'm super confident in the car. I don't think I'm gonna have any issues down the road with it. But those are just some of the things that you can expect with your car. Those are some of the issues that I had with my car. Now, the next part of maintenance that I wanna talk about is going to have to do with the manual transmission. It's a little bit different with the DCT models, but with my particular, E92 M3, it is time to do a complete transmission refresh on this car. I'm going to be replacing the clutch. I'm probably gonna go with an upgraded aftermarket clutch. I'm gonna be replacing the flywheel. I'm gonna be replacing the shifter, the shift linkage, the shift shaft seal. I'm gonna be replacing the universal flex disc. There's a lot of items that are in the drivetrain underneath that also go along with the transmission that should be refreshed. Funny enough, a lot of these same items I've refreshed on pretty much all of my manual cars really makes a big difference in an 
older car like this. In addition to all of those parts mounts, so your motor mounts, if you're doing your rod bearings, you might as well do your motor mounts as well. Mine were in really bad condition. They were completely falling apart. That makes a big difference in a car like this that's, you know, 15 years old, 90,000 miles. Put new motor mounts in, everything feels a lot tighter, a lot more solid. And the same goes for your transmission mounts. That's gonna help a lot of the shaking, the moving back and forth when you are shifting. So I guess now we can move on to some of the modifications on my particular model. Um, there's obviously quite a few things that I've done to this car. We can talk about the performance stuff that I've done first. So let's talk a little bit about the suspension. I have replaced every bushing, every arm, every link, every tie rod um, up front. This is completely refreshed up front. I have the H&R sway bars front and back, and then I also have the Turner Motorsports control arms, the lower control arms. I have the Bimmer World sway bar end links, and then I went with all of the rest of the arms and bushings are OEM. So I just kept them OEM to keep it, you know, this is a street car, this isn't a track car. So I wanted something that was gonna be relatively comfortable to drive. Once you go down that road of replacing everything with very rigid and stiff components, it can get a little too gnarly to drive on the street. Even the lower control arms, the Turner lower control arms were a bit overkill. That's something that I might actually just go back to OEM. I do like the way that it drives, but it is very stiff and it's also very heavy with the hydraulic steering. It's not bad by any means, but you know, when you're just putzing around town, it can be a bit much. As far as my actual suspension, I am running the Olin's Road and Track coilovers with the Millway camber plates. And man, I absolutely love this setup. I've ran a lot of cars with KW V3 coils, KW V2, V1, a lot of different spring setups, but this is by far the, the best and just my favorite in general suspension setup that I've ran. It's really, really nice. You get a ton of performance out of the box with it, but also it's very comfortable. As far as the braking, I went with the E9X to F8X brake kit conversion. So these are the F80 M3 brakes, and then I just had them powder coated in a CCB gold. So they kind of look like the carbon ceramics, but they're not ceramics. They're just your average F8X steel brakes. Really, really awesome brake upgrade. Highly recommended. However, you get a ton of brake dust with this setup. So if that's something that annoys you, you might want to look elsewhere. You are going to get a lot more brake dust. I went with the EBC ceramic pads, which, you know, is supposed to be like the best option out there for reducing the amount of brake dust that you get. And they do help, but they definitely don't solve everything. So it's a fair trade-off in my opinion. You know, you're getting a lot of performance, a lot more bite out of these brakes, but you will notice an uptick in brake dust. Pretty simple there. That's all of the suspension stuff that I've done. We do have to do some work on the rear. I haven't done any of the arms or bushings in the rear, so that will have to be taken care of. As far as engine modifications, I've kept this pretty simple, man. This car isn't even tuned. And for the most part, it's pretty much stock. Um, I did a triple baffle power steering reservoir from Turner. It did come with the Dynan underdrive pulley. It does have CSF radiator, performance radiator, and oil cooler. And then we also added the Turner Motorsports plenum and intake, which just sounds unbelievable. So that's pretty much why I went and did that. Other than that, it is completely stock up here. There's nothing else that I've added. And to be completely honest, other than maybe doing some sort of conservative conservative tune, I likely will not be adding any more performance parts to this car. It is perfect the way it is. And this is just not one of those cars that you buy to make it really fast. You buy this car for the corners, you buy this car for the feeling, you buy this car for the connectivity, you buy this car because of the way that it sounds, the nostalgia of it. If you want a fast car, just go over to S55, S58, or even B58. It's not that these are very slow cars, but by today's standards, these really don't touch any of the newer cars on the market. You're just losing a lot of the torque but if sound and handling and the feeling is more your thing then this car is definitely for you this is definitely the way to go they're never going to make a naturally aspirated v8 m3 again that's why these cars are so special and that's why we love them so much as far as the exhaust on this car i'm running the valve tronic full exhaust system all the way up to the headers the headers are stock but instead of going with a catless setup i actually ended up going with the 200 cell valve tronic exhaust setup and it's awesome man i mean this exhaust sounds really, really good on this car. I'm very happy with it. it the car originally had a Meister shaft exhaust on it, and it was 
okay, but I just really like having the flexibility of being able to open and close the valves, you know, when I'm pulling in and out of my neighborhood. There's also some times where I'm on the phone and I don't want the valves open because the car is super loud. It does have a V8, you guys, so it is a, <laughs> it is a very, very loud car, but also, you know, when I'm out cruising with the boys or I'm hitting it in the mountains, I want this thing to rip, I want it loud. So that's the best part about having a Valvetronic exhaust is that you can open it and close it. But overall, when it comes down to performance, that is going to be it. Will I add anything else? The rest of the performance modifications are probably going to be aftermarket clutch, things of that nature, a short shifter, but I don't really want to supercharge this car or anything like that. I think that they just, the superchargers on these cars are fun, but they reduce the overall lifespan of the engine, especially if you're driving it hard. And there's no way that I would put a supercharger on this car and just not drive it hard. There's just something more exciting in my opinion about having a car that isn't all that fast but you can give it the full beans as much as possible i've owned a lot of quick cars decently quick cars you know mid 600 wheel horsepower but this is by far my favorite car and i think that that says something because you know it's obviously not the fastest it's not the slowest but it's definitely the best feeling. Some of the other things I wanted to point out when it comes to maintenance items that I almost forgot that a lot of people don't really talk about, a lot of the little vacuum hoses and plastic clips in this car, they're going to break. With the amount of heat that these engine bays get, with the age and the mileage, those are going to go old, they're going to dry rot, they're going to break, they're going to leak. So you know, if you're buying an older car, those are also things that you're just gonna have to expect to replace at some point. They're not gonna be the most expensive items, but you know, you can't expect to pick up an older BMW or any older car for that matter and not have to expect to replace a lot of these older items because they're just wear and tear items. And with age and with heat and with climate, mileage, those things are going to go bad. All right, so I've covered all of the maintenance stuff that I've had to tackle on my car and kind of what I can expect in the future and also what you can expect if you wanna buy one of these cars. We've also tackled some of the performance upgrades. Let's talk a little bit about cosmetics and interior. All right, so the obvious is the wrap. We already talked about that. Let's talk about the other things up front. We'll just work our way to the back and then we'll hit the interior. So the kidney grills are just your factory gloss black E92 M3 kidney grills. Some people like to do the double slatted. I just think that those look kind of odd on these cars. I try to keep it like as period specific as possible. Um, I also have the blacked out roundels, shadow line roundels, which I think look really good. This is the V2 GT4 lip from Sue near uh, carbon fiber lip. The reason I really like this one is it's a bit shorter than the original GT4 lip. The original GT4 lip comes out to like there. It's freaking insane how long it is. It's cool. I mean, it definitely will create a lot of downforce, but I think it's a bit overkill for the street. So that's kind of why I went with this one. Fits really good, looks really good, super easy to install. The headlights are actually OEM headlights. So these aren't new, these aren't aftermarket. Um, I kept these pretty simple. I did put some H8 bulbs in them so they look nice and new. I did polish the lenses so they look really, really clean. And then also you'll notice that the entire bumper is a little bit different. Maybe you noticed, maybe you didn't. This is the European model bumper. So it actually shaves off the headlight washers and then also the side markers it's just a cleaner look um, that is also from souvenir i'll have all this stuff linked down below for you guys the wheels are the apex vs5 rs's and these are in satin black um, i have a 18 by nine and a half in the front and an 18 by ten and a half in the rear those are going to be an offset of plus 22. it's actually the exact same setup that i'm running on my 1m clone as well as far as tires we have the r triple eight r's i've got 265 30 on the front and 295.30 in the rear. These tires are awesome. However, if this is like your daily, probably not the best move. Um, they are pretty loud and they are not good in rain at all. But man, once you get them warmed up on a dry day, these things are awesome. They handle so incredibly good. As we discussed before, I have the F80 brake conversion on this car. Then moving along to the side, these are the Souvenir side skirt extensions, just carbon fiber side skirt extensions that kind of flow with my front lip, which I think just looks super, super clean on this car. I am also running a stud kit conversion, which I think is just super crucial in all these cars. Pretty much all my cars always have stud kit conversions. Another thing that I forgot to mention before, you know, is a lot of like the little trims and seals and like the cow
towel, you're gonna have to replace those too. Like those are wear and tear items, they're gonna go bad. And those sort of things add up. Like these things are not cheap from BMW. It's hundreds of hundreds of dollars to get this car looking like, you know, it did back in 2008. Coming around to the rear, I am running the LCI taillights. Now these are aftermarket and they have like a sequential blink to them. Um, they look pretty cool. To be completely honest, I had no idea that they had the sequential blink to them. If I had known that, I probably would have bought them without the sequential and just got like a normal one, but whatever. I still think they look pretty good. The entire trunk is carbon fiber. So I've heard a few different names for this. One is like the Amaze, one is the Ericsson. It's not a CSL. The CSL trunk has a bit more of like an oval to it. Um, this one has a little bit harder edge to the top, kind of like a smaller duck bill. I think it looks really good on this car though. It's definitely my favorite carbon trunk option for this car. Um, when we wrapped it, we just left the top of it exposed carbon, which is a nice little added touch. And of course we have the blacked out M3 badge, blacked out roundel on the back. Looks really, really good. Factory rear bumper, nothing changed there. And that is it. That's it. I really haven't done much on the exterior of this car and I don't think it needs much. Some people are saying, oh, you should do a diffuser. I really don't like any of the diffuser options on this car. And I think sometimes when you put more parts on these cars that are aftermarket, it just kind of hinders with like the driving experience and some things can go wrong, especially with the diffusers. Like I've seen a lot of diffusers, they just don't fit well. They don't really look that good. And I know for sure they create more rattles. So that's one thing that I'm I'm trying to do is just avoid putting parts on to just put them on. If I'm gonna put something on the car, there's gotta be an intention behind it. And the last thing that I want it to do is just affect, you know, performance or just overall drivability. Um, that's kind of been my thing with diffusers. I've just had a really bad experience in the past with running diffusers on the E9X, E8X car. So I sort of just avoid them at all costs. Plus, I just don't really think that this car needs a diffuser. I think that it looks really good just the way it is, you know. Um, there's definitely a way to overdo it on a car. And I've learned in the past sometimes, Less is more when it comes to aftermarket modifications on these cars. So let's take a look at the inside. Now, like I said, obviously single hump, manual, some of the more basic things. I do have the Kith floor mats. So these are actually for the, I believe G series, but they had also fit the F series and they also fit the E series. They're not perfect. You can see how it like bends up a little bit, but they work and it's definitely not bad. You'd never be able to tell that they, you know, weren't made for this car. I think they look really good. Just freshly put in my Recaro pole positions. Absolutely in love with these seats in this car. I think that they just work perfectly for this car. I love the way that it sits you in the car, the seating position, the way that they feel, the way that they look. They're just a 10 out of 10. This is a custom AZA auto wheel steering wheel. It's leather on the side, Alcantara on top and bottom, M stitching, super plain, super simple and I love the way that looks as well. I ended up going with the ZHP weighted shift knob. Really like the way that this looks, really like the way that it feels, probably wouldn't change that much. And then lastly, I also have the PS Designs GTS Alcantara Armrest Elite, which is kind of critical if you're gonna run the pole positions. You sit so much lower than like the factory armrest, just it's too high for your arms. So that's a nice addition as well. I do have some other bits coming. Um, I am changing out all the trim to Alcantara. I'm doing an Alcantara shift boot, Alcantara e-brake boot, and then I also have a custom rear seat delete coming that's gonna look really good. Sort of tie this thing all together. I do have my Valentin 1 radar detector mounted up there. And uh, yeah, overall, that is it for the interior, man. Again, haven't really done that much to this car. I think the majority of the work that I've put into this car has been in the suspension. I definitely had to do a ton of work there, but those were some of the items that I installed in the car that made the biggest difference overall, just in the way that the car drove, the way it felt, the way it handled. So I feel like I always forget at least one thing, but I think that's pretty much all of it on this car. And it's not really that much stuff. And to be honest, I feel like I'm just really happy with where the car's at. There's not too much more that I wanna add to it. Outside of addressing, you know, those rear suspension components and then some of the drivetrain, clutch, transmission items, this car is pretty much perfect and I wouldn't change a thing. It drives so incredibly good. And from six months ago when I bought this car to what it is now, it is a completely different car. For one, it looks entirely different. Two, it drives entirely different. And three, it sounds a whole lot different as well. But yeah, you guys, I just wanted to make this video and kind of update you with where we were at with the E92 M3. We've put a lot of work into it. And if you're interested in buying an E92 or an E90 M3, dude, I say do it. Like these are just one of the coolest, most interesting BMWs that were ever made with a naturally aspirated V8 and you're never going to see one of these cars made again. 
who knows if we even get manuals anymore in the future. Now, whether you wanna go and buy like the DCT or the manual, I think both are awesome. I actually really, really liked my DCT and my E90 M3, and someday I wouldn't mind having another DCT E90 M3. But I think in the E92, being that this is the coupe, the sports car model, the manual just makes sense in this car. It's not like you're trying to go fast in this car, so like the DCT, in my opinion, doesn't really makes sense for a car like this, unless you just straight up don't like manual. But for an older sports car like this, where it's all about feeling and connectivity, the manual just, it just makes sense. It just adds to that experience when you're driving the car and it's so much fun. Hands down, one of my favorite cars that I've ever owned and ever been able to build on this channel. And I feel like I've finally gotten to the point in my career where I'm giving it the justice that it deserves. I'm starting to go after parts on these cars that are really good quality parts. I'm not skimping, I'm not cheaping out, and I'm just sort of taking my time with it and doing things the right way. That's the same approach that I've been taking with the 1M clone, where I still have a lot of work to do on that car, but I'm now at a point where I'm very intentionally picking the parts that I put on these cars. But overall, should you buy one of these cars? I say yes, just be ready, man. Be ready because there is going to be a lot of stuff that you're going to have to replace. It's not because it's a bad car, it's just because it's an older car. These cars are 10, 15 years old. They have around 90, 100,000 miles on them. Unless you want to find one that has 20, 30,000 miles, you're going to pay a lot for it, which in my opinion isn't really worth it because an older car is an older car and things are going to be bad. Sometimes with these cars, the less they're driven, the more problems that you get. I like to think of these cars as like muscles and if you don't exercise them, they sort of go out of shape. So it's good to drive these cars. It's good to keep them running. It's good to be pushing them on a daily basis. They like it. These cars were made for. It. You just have to keep in mind that regardless of the car, maintenance is a real thing. And as long as you're on top of it, and as long as you're prepared, you're going to enjoy the ownership experience of an E9 XM3. Anyways, guys, I hope this video found you well. If you have any questions for me, leave them down in the comments. Make sure you guys check out the website, www.thickwhips.com. I have all of the parts from all of my builds on that website, wheel entire fitment directory, maintenance items, blogs, everything you'll ever need if you own a BMW. Anyways, that's gonna wrap this one up. Appreciate you guys. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you